He is, David is the, from the Ocean Systems Laboratory, Edinburgh Centre for Robotics in Harriet Watt University. So thank you very much for coming to join us today. Right. Pass straight to you now. Yeah, and uh, good afternoon everybody. Carol's got my watch by the way, so I have no idea what time, <laughs> how time's going here, but I'm sure she'll tell me. Can we start I'm... filming again? <laughs> She'll tell me when my, my time's up. Yeah. So I'm David Lane from the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, um, as Carol quite rightly said. Um, I'm going to be do a quick plug for the centre because you can't come to these kind of things and say a few words. We're it's a joint venture between Edinburgh and Harry Watt University. There's about 30 of us as, as uh, principal investigators doing a broad range of robotics subjects, of which marine robotics is a very important part. Um, we're doing 100 PhD students over the next five years in the centre, and all of them we want to be innovation ready. So these are kids who can people who can, you know, they know something about the technology, but they also know about how that translates into uh, innovation in businesses and licensing and so on. Um, we're very well funded by government, we've got lots of kits, some of it marine kit, but lots of other stuff, humanoids, uh, that, that we work with, and some of that will come out later on as we go. And we're quite proud of some of our big successes, which are part of journal publications and the businesses that we've created out of the centre, some of them working in the marine space, and I'll be referring to that as we go to see by uh, um, in my world, I'm, I'm sort of partly a signal processor, so I have uh, great respect for Nick's work, uh, but I'm also a roboticist, and I'll be talking a bit later about some of the things that we're doing with vehicles um, and robot systems, and AI features, artificial intelligence features a lot in that, but for the sensors part of what we're talking about today, I want to talk a little bit about three different kinds of sensing that we're engaged with, all three of which are biomimetically inspired. So, some of the new frontiers in where we might go with sensing in the ocean environment are coming inspired from animals such as the ones you see here uh, uh, in, in nature. And I'm going to start with fish, which Nick was talking about. Um, wonderful animal. Next time you have a fish on your plate uh, ready to eat, you should have great humility. They are a fantastic sensing machine, as well as being very tasty food. Um, they have a, an organ there, which you may know down the side of their body, called the fish lateral line, shown in red. Uh, on the side there. And what the lateral line does is it's an unusual sensor, it's a sensor that we don't have. Right? It measures flow. And they have a variety of, of sensors that are, that are embedded in a canal structure. And from that, those po point measurements of flow down the length of their body, they're able to build images, hydrodynamic images, of what's happening in the water around them. So that's quite an interesting thing to be able to do. And they, they kind of do, it's not really beam forming, but it's kind of like beam forming in the way that they're able to construct an image. And they use that for all sorts of things. They use it for uh, helping to swim and stay next to the fish next to them when they're in a shoal. They use it for detecting friend or foe or food or a mate. Um, and, and just knowing what's going on around them. So we've been working a little bit on uh, ways that we can maybe use the developed fish lateral, analogs of fish lateral lines to do other things. And so we have one program going at the moment. It's a European project. We're, very, we're grateful to be able to work in Europe. It's a fantastic place to be. There's a plug. Uh, okay, with some of our partners in uh, the Netherlands and in Estonia. Estonia was mentioned earlier on. A uh, great nation. Um, uh, it's called Lashley. And what we're, and companies in Aberdeen. And basically, we're doing a sort of fiber optic uh, analog of the fish lateral line, embedding it in the cable. <coughs> Um, and we're going to put it on the seafloor, and we're going to use it to do the same kind of hydrodynamic imaging looking up at whatever's happening in the water column. And the interesting thing we hope to be able to do there are useful things, of course, for things like uh, marine renewable energy. You want to see how, what, what vortices are coming off the back of your turbine. Is it working efficiently? But of course, there's a, there's a huge sort of uh, maritime protection theme that goes like alongside that. Can you uh, observe what's happening in you know, the water column above you, bad guys coming in, and perhaps even submarines? What we don't know is, and what we haven't really got to yet, is what are the sorts of ranges that we could, we could work on. It's very embryonic technology, because it really depends on you know, how well can we fabricate these fi fiber optic systems, how well can we embed them in the cable, how robust are they when you, when you play them out the back of the ship and deploy them. I mean, there's a whole lot of things like that, very, very practical issue. Um, but we're hopeful, because what you're basically able to see, observe is dipoles, um, that will be able to build images, perhaps a little bit like one top left there, but other ones instead, um, that will give us a, 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 a good visibility of what's happening in the water. And this is a new technology, right? If the, all we're able to do at the moment to do some of the things, to image hydrodynamically or to use ADCPs, so acoustic Doppler current profilers, which are just basically sort of three beams and they measure the water motion and you have a number of sparse sampling points. So this could be a huge development. 
Um, whether it matches to the sort of scales that Nick was talking about, we don't know. Um, but I think that's an exciting way ahead. And um, just to, I'm, I'm, I'm all, I think it's going to work here. Please work, please work. Let's go back and come back in again. All right. It's going to work. If it doesn't work, I'm, oh, I'm going to work. Another wonderful thing about fish, and this is morphing into robots a little bit. Um, this is some work by some people at the Lauder Lab. This, this is a, looking down on an image of a trout. Um, it's swimming in a calm vortex street, so there's uh, fluid flowing from, from left to right around the pole and turbulence. Um, the key thing is the fish is dead. Okay? So dead fish are able to swim upstream. And so without any sensing at all, you know, there's clearly a lot you can do in the embodiment of fish that we could, that you could build on. And some of the work we've been involved with, again with our partners in Tallinn, and working on biomedic fish um, on biomedic platforms that can be used. In this case, we're looking at REC surveys. So if the SSSBA sinks, we can go into it and have a look at what went on. Um, uh, and we're doing some, some uh, archaeological mapping work in, a, in a, an old Soviet prison in a Roman quarry in uh, Estonia. Um, but from that, you can bring back all, all sorts of interesting things. We were doing uh, video mosaicing <coughs> and 3D reconstruction of uh, objects. And so these are, these are, this is an old Soviet tractor at the bottom of the uh, Roman quarry. So there are um, uh, Quite interesting things you can do with these biometric platforms and with optical sensors on them to give you a sort of situational awareness of what's going on. The second technology I'd like to look at is acoustic, and we've been working for some time with the US Navy and the people in Spain War of San Diego, but latterly also with uh, Royal Navy over here, on sonar designs that are inspired by dolphins. Dolphins have a fantastic sonar, it has great range, it works in the sort of 10 to 100 kilohertz range. Um, but the, they're able to distinguish not only something the size of a ping pong ball at the length of a football pitch, but they can also tell you what's inside it. They can distinguish between one that's filled with water and one that's filled with uh, paraffin. So they have fantastic sonars, but it works at very low frequencies. So, so, so that where it can propagate over reasonably long distances, not the ranges that they talking about. Um, and what we discovered working with the dolphin clicks that they use for echolocation is that the, the, the signal structure is a double down shirt. So, so, so the time frequency, the, the diagram in the middle there at the top, um, it's a double down shirt structure. But what they're doing is changing uh, both the slope of the down shirt, the, the time difference between the two chirps, and the power levels. And so when the dolphin first puts its head in the water to go and look for something, it searches around the, that space in time frequency to understand you know, what's the, what's, the sig what's the signal that's going to give me the best, the least clutter and the best signal uh, resolution, and then it uses that. And actually some of them get quite lazy and they sort of forget to keep looking, and in some cases they actually bump into things because they're not looking properly where, where they're going acoustically. Um, uh, so we've been working on building similar platforms and we've been using them. We've got a spin-up company, Hyperson, which is now making these commercially. And the USP for them, the unique selling point, is that they uh, are very good at seeing inside objects. So we can distinguish man-made objects from uh, uh, natural ones. And so, for example, in the mine warfare arena, um, some of the bad guys build mines that look like rocks. So everything else that we do with our side scan sonars trying to recognize them don't, doesn't work. Um, with, uh, with this technology, you can see inside. You can get some of the resonances from inside the object, and therefore you're able to understand um, what you're actually looking at. And similarly, in uh, offshore community for detecting blockages in pipelines, you can see inside the pipeline or flooded member detection in, um, uh, uh, in pillars and verticals in uh, oil roofs. So that's an exciting technology. Um, and again, for archaeology, very useful for mapping the seabed. There's a lot of other things about resolution. And the last thing I want to talk about in this section is electric sense. And I know that um, Brendan's going to be talking about things electrical uh, later on, wherever he is. Um, and so, uh, uh, which is using for communication. Um, but hey, this isn't actually our work, this is the work of an, another EU project, great to be involved, I got to review it, uh, called Angels, finished a couple of years ago, and uh, it's people from the uh, uh, Institutes of France and uh, across uh, Switzerland and Germany. Um, and what they were doing was looking at, again, copying what fish do. Some fish use an electric sense in order to understand what's happening around them. And um, uh, there's some quite interesting things that they do. It's very short range, so it's only a few centimeters, but they can do things like see round corners, because that's how the, how the field patterns go. Um, obviously, they can distinguish friend and foe and food. Um, uh, 
not affected by visibility. Um, and interesting, they, they also because a fish bends its body as it swims, then also it can bend its body to improve its sense of processing. So there's some quite interesting effects that the fish are using uh, in order to do that. So they've uh, done some quite nice demonstrations. This is a movie here which is very slow to start, where they've demonstrated that you, with an electric sense mounted on a very small um, AUV platform working in a tank, they can get it to do um, things like navigating, there's a dipole in the, in the water, and what they're doing is navigating around the dipole. So they're using the dipole as a source of electric dipole as a source of uh, navigation information. Um, and then they also use it later on um, as a means to uh, uh, avoid objects. So there's quite a few things you can do with electric sense, and people are making the first steps of that, of mapping it onto vehicle platforms um, for sort of relatively short range uh, uh, applications. And in this case, the robot they built with this kind of snake like thing, so it, it also did this as it, as it was swimming along, but that's a, uh, a separate, uh, separate phenomenon. Okay, that's me for now. I'll be back later and talk a little bit about AI and, and robots and stuff like that. Thank you very much.